Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Thank you to the organization for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And yes, it's going to be a kind of different talk. Let's see if you like it or not. So yes, first, a little bit about this talk. I mean, I got a mail from Peter, like, OK, could you speak at CSS Day? It was like, whoa, I was not expecting that. It's like an amazing event. And I was not expecting to be like sharing the lineup with these great speakers. Let's see if I managed to do something good enough. And then the mail was quite explicit. I started with, we don't want you to talk about grid. <laughs> I mean, about how grid works in general. Because, I mean, we want you to explain how hard or how easy it is to implement that in a browser, which is quite different. Basically, you already know grid. They told me, so I guess you all know grid. So we don't need to explain that. But you don't know how it takes to implement something like grid or some CSS property or whatever in a, in a browser. That's kind of different. So yes, Tab did a great introduction about me. I work at Igalia. We are an open source consultancy. We are based in the northwest of Spain. But we have people around the globe. We have a flat structure, so we are kind of a special company. And they have been working in the browser since 2013, I believe, implementing CSS specifications, features, bu fixing bugs, and all that, mostly on Chromium and WebKit, where I'm owner and reviewer, respectively. And like as part of this work and interactions with the CSS working group, I became a member of the group like two years ago. So some of the things I have been working on, I mean, I, in my blog post, in my blogs, I always speak about these kind of things. I was working in regions in a long time ago when that was still a thing, then grid layout for, I'm still doing some things there. Then past year with CSS containment, that is a kind of cool spec, and then some small things and back fixes and all that. So, yes, I mean, I mean, one of the things was how complex it is to implement something like grid layout in a browser. So, I'm not going to review the history. I mean, like, when CSS started, they were already thinking about something like grid. But just the recent things that happened in, during this decade, basically. So, the initial spec by Microsoft, they started to work like to the, at the beginning of the decade somehow, and the initial spec that was published was in 2011. And then uh, Internet Explorer 10 released the first prefixed versions of this initial spec the year later. And Google started to work on it in WebKit because it was before the fork, so it was still the same engine than Safari. But by the end of 2011, but they stopped to, I mean, they were not working a lot on it and they were losing some traction somehow. And Bloomberg, that is a kind of power use, user of the web platform because they have very complex UIs and all that, sponsored Igalia to work on the implementation in Chromium and, and WebKit. And we started on that by summer 2013. And on the Firefox side, Mozilla started like around 2014. So at the end, 2017, so it take a while, like you see, and after lots of changes on the spec, lots of changes in the implementations, interrupt issues and all that, I like a quite unique event in the history of the web somehow. All the browsers, Chromium, Firefox, and Safari, like within a few months, they shipped it all together, CSS with Laya. We were all in conversation with the CSS working group with Mozilla and all that to make that happen. And even Ed joined it a few months later, so it was like, everything at the same time, so it was really great. But it's take a while. So when I was thinking about what I can do in this talk, because it's like a completely new talk for this event, I, I never did it before, I was thinking like, okay, I can go to the CSS spec, it's very huge, it has lots of complexities and sections that are where you can explain a lot of things and go into the details of the track sizing algorithm that is very complex, things like that. But I thought that would, that was, could be like too theoretical and maybe really boring. So I prefer, I, I, I thought in a different idea, like what happens if we implement a new property during this talk for real layout? That's maybe more boring than the other part because I'm going to show some C++ code and let's see how, how it goes. So first the idea came from a presentation that Jen Simmons gave in TPAC 2016 to the CSS working group where she was uh, explaining some ideas 
about like uh, new regions spec based on grid layout because grid creates this uh, cell so you can flow the content there and things like that. And in one of the slides, this ha she has this idea of, okay, we can maybe have gaps. So the content, uh, I mean, doesn't use that gap, so we can create some nice layouts. So during this talk, we are going to uh, write a new property that will allow us to do that in grid somehow. So basically, the main goal of the, of the talk is that you somehow get to know how is the whole process when you're implementing a feature. So there are different steps. The CSS working group discuss about if that makes sense or not, what could be the name of the property, the syntax, all that. Then you need to, to tell the community you are working on that you are going to implement that. You usually implement everything behind a runtime flag, so web authors can start to play with it before it's ready. Then you, of course, need to do a test for the for the feature, and they are now shared between the different implementations, so that's really nice. And then eventually at some point you can ship the feature and make it appear in the stable releases of the browsers. So maybe these steps doesn't have to be like in the disorder exactly, but let's start for one of them, the CSS working group. I mean, you already know, probably uh, Fantasy already told before that there is a GitHub repository with issues, and you can go there, comment on the issues, all the discussions that happen on the meetings get recorded and appear on the different issues, so you can follow discussions and participate there. And for example, I can create a new issue like this one. Okay, you have a new CSS property that can mark some cells that are busy and you don't use that when we are out of placement items. This is not going to happen in the very soon, but maybe it's an idea for the future and it can be discussed there and all that. So one part is that, or either we have a very clear name for the property or there are some kind of back sharing to find the proper name. How we can call this property, maybe grid BC cells, or maybe grid empty cells, I don't know. Or grid taking areas, because maybe it's an area, not just a cell, so a bunch of them. Or maybe grid skip areas. I, I choose the last one, I like it. it. <laughs> So for this talk, we are going to, with the last one, but that might vary. And then we need to define like an, a kind of grammar for, the, for that property. So basically, we already have the grid area shorthand in CSS grid layout, where we put a line, a slash, another line, a slash. I mean, the row start, column start, row end, column end, with a slash. So basically, we could reuse that. And this grammar means that, okay, with grid skip areas can be known, or this uh, hash symbol is like a comma separator list of, of grid areas. Maybe this is not the best syntax possible, but this is the one that I choose for this talk. So basically, once this is implemented, we will have for this example, we could say grid skip areas, choose last two, so that's the second row, second column, and comma, three years last three, and all that. But the CSS working group doesn't just, okay, we are this and we are done. There are many more things that we need to think about, like which, what's the interac interaction of this new property with the rest of the grid spec, because there can be many, many things happening there. For example, can we position items still on these skipped areas or not? That's a decision to, to take. I guess we can, but it's something that we should decide somehow. How this interact with out of it that removes the empty tracks. I mean, if you are marking the, it at, at empty, you don't want it to be removed, so. Or is there a way to specify this in grid template areas directly? Maybe a hash symbol or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> and many other questions. So it's not that simple like just deciding a name and a grammar. There are more that happens there. So basically now you want to do something like this, you need this kind of dummy element that you place here in the middle with no content and then the rest flows around. In the future with this property, we could do grid skip areas, two, two, and so we are somehow in the time machine. We are now in the future. <laughs> we are at the end of the presentation when we have already implemented this. We can move this a little bit. It's working. So let's see. 
So one of the parts of this process is to notify the community. Either, I mean, now all the browsers are open source engines at the end because it has moved to Chromium. So either Chromium or WebKit or, or Mozilla community about that you're going to implement that. This intends to implement our basically a mail to the project mailing list where you explain the main motivation of that feature, the main use cases, you do a description, you talk about the status of the specification, that if there are any interoperability, compatibility issue, risks, and things like that. There are templates for these, for these kind of mails in Chromium and Firefox. WebKit has a not so strict process, so it's not the same thing. And then for example, in Chromium, the request, like you ask the tag for a review, the tag is the W3C Technical Architecture Group. There is a group of elected people that is like taking care of reviewing how the whole web platform evolves and the new specification, how they interact with each other or if there are any conflict or whatever. And they usually, usually provide feedback about the new, new specs and new ideas. So basically these are the project mailing lists. They are all public and you can follow them. And if you see intents there, you see that people are planning to work on, on these features. So let's go to the funny part, maybe, the implementation process and how it is. So first, yeah, for, I'm going to do all of this in Chromium. I mean, I could choose WebKit. I also work on it. I don't know so well how it works in Firefox, but the main ideas and concepts are going to be very, very similar. So first thing in Chromium, you will need to get the code, download it, and build it. That's going to take a while because, I mean, it's a very large code base and it's going to take maybe two hours or it depends on your machine, but it's going to take a while. Only downloading it is already taking some time. It has lots of dependencies and all that. So basically, the source code, what we are going to touch today is mostly in this. This is, I mean, Chromium source code. And then there are like these third-party folders because it was in the past called WebKit. Now it's renamed to Blink, it's a rendering engine, and inside render it and core. There we have quite a lot of things. <laughs> but yeah, but maybe some of here are like CSS. Okay, that's interesting for us. Layout. There are also style around here. So yeah, I mean the code bus is is really huge. But anyway. So First thing is that when you're implementing something new, you don't want just to implement it in the browser so it appears in the next release. You usually do that behind a runtime flag. Adding a runtime flag is very simple. Just you modify a JSON, you add it like status experimental. I call it CSS day grid skip areas to the runtime flag. So if you have it enabled, it will, I mean, it will use the code or not. But just building these two, three lines, like it generates quite a lot of code from that JSON. It took 10 minutes in this lab, so it took a while. Ah, and I have linked it when you, I mean, the slides are on my blog, and and this, I mean, all patches are linked, so you can take a look to the exact patches because I'm not going to show the whole thing, but anyway. So then we are going to work on parsing that feature. So we know that we have this grid area shorthand, so we already have some code to parse this grid line slash, grid line slash. So to simplify this a little bit, I started with just one single area, and then we will move to have multiple ones. So we are either accept none or just one. So we look for the code of the, of the parsing that is parsing the grid area shorthand. Basically, yes, we need to look for the file, whatever. And it's basically, yes, row star value is consuming a grid line. And then uh, if there are a slash, it consumes a slash, and then it gets the column start, row end, and column end. So we move that code to a new method in an utility class that's just a small refactoring so we can use it later. So basically, now the shorthand, the parsing, parsing the shorthand is just calling this new method, consume criteria, and, and we are done. And yeah, this patch was quite small. It was quite, quite fast. Now we have just a small refactoring. Now let's start to add the new property, and then we will parse it and all that. 
So when we add a new property in Chromium, we have this JSON file again. And there are many things here, many attributes, but basically the name of the property is important, of course. This runtime flag is that this property is going to be enabled only when the runtime flag is enabled. If it's disabled, it's going to be disabled. So you get that for free. Then this grid area positions is like the type that this is going to return you when you query that is in the in the style. Basically, we already have grid position for grid lines because grid line can be a number one, but it can be also to foo, if it refers to the second line name foo or whatever, so it's not just a basic integer or whatever. And then a converter for that, that's not really important. So yes, this grid area positions class is very simple. Row star, row n, column star, column n, with a grid position, nothing really fancy here. One important thing is that for each CSS property in Chromium, we have a new use counter so in this case, you need to go to this file and look for the switch, which is a huge switch, and then add your property and the next number. <laughs> I mean, the, the, you check the last one and you just add one and put the number there. With that, you will have these things that appear in Chrome platform status. I guess you already know that. This, there are CSS metrics, so you can go to a, all the CSS properties and see how people are using it. Of course, this is not perfect because if you are, you can opt out to don't send this information to Google when you use Chromium, or if you are behind a, a proxy in a company or whatever, maybe you are not sending that information, but it gave some information about how properties are being used. So this is, I mean, you, I guess you already know this, and you can see how the different things are being used. And yes, again, there are also, apart from the CSS properties, you can, add use counters to other parts of the code. That's useful when you are going to like, okay, can we change this completely and how it works? If it's very, I mean, if it has a lot of people using it, you cannot just change it. It's impossible, I mean, but when something is like 0.01% of page loads are using this property, okay, maybe it's time to deprecate or remove it. I mean, we are safe somehow. It's not the only, uh, and the only, thing that to decide that, but it's part of the information you use. And then the parsing. In this case, we are going to the long hands because this grid is keep areas a long hand. And okay, if it's known, we just use none. And otherwise we consume grid area, the methods that we refactored before. So the parsing is again, not very complex. And then, the, okay, this is maybe more complex, but you get this CSS value from the parser and you want to became into this grid area positions class, but it's very easy. Again, we get the items of the list and put them like row star, column star, and all that. Not, not that complex. We will build this thing, and then at this stage, we can parse that. I mean, the browser will accept this property. If you put it and you go to the dev tools, you will see that it's not like a strike, it's fine. And you can just put one area or using, I mean, like span two or, or names of, I mean, like foo or whatever, name of, name of lines even. And, and yeah, I mean, but it, it's parsing it, but it's not doing anything with the property yet. I mean, we didn't do the rest of the code yet. So if you want, I mean, to, to do the rest of things, there is, okay, we get here the, we are converting here things to the grid span class. This is actually an internal class. Basically, we have these lines that are span two, so we want that to refer to an actual line. So we have some code that is doing that work and translating that span two to maybe three. If you were started in one or maybe four, if we start in two. And then there is the layout code that is, I mean, all the different and layout things have like these classes, layout grid for grid layout, layout flexbox for flexbox, layout table for tables. I mean, there are many, I mean, there are like the main classes. This is changing because Chromium is implementing the new rendering engine, layout ng, but this is still like that. And then yeah, in this, we can access to the style. Like we are doing it here actually. Style grid skip area, we get the property and we got the column star or whatever. So we have at the end a grid skip area 
that they, I mean, this is the, the thing that we need to avoid, placing items there. So then we have the auto placement algorithms that is the one in charge of putting the items inside the grid, looking for the empty positions and all that. We need to pass that, that object there. And there is a kind of a special thing in, thing in our implementation in Chromium because we used to have a matrix, which is a vector of vectors, so the implementation was quite simple, but it was taking a lot of memory, and now we use double linked list. So imagine that we have this grid that only has four items, but it has nine cells. With the old memory structure, we are creating one cell per each. I mean, these are the rows, and each row has a vector of the three columns, and we are creating one cell, even if we are, we are, we are not using five. And now we are using this double linked list, so we avoid that. It's more complex, but we save a lot of memory. We have a 100 by 100 grid. It's like before we were creating 10,000 cells, and now we are going to create only four if we have only four items. So it's, it makes a difference. So in this case, we could mark, OK, if we have grid skip area 2-2, two, two, we can mark this like, OK, this, we should skip this, and we just skip this during the process, but in this case, we don't have that cell to mark it like a skip, so we, we need to find a different alternative. In this case, there, is a, there are a next empty grid area method, so in, I implemented a overlaps grid skip area, so it checks if it's overlap, overlapping or not the grid skip area, and if it's overlapping, it moves to the next track, looking for the, for the gap. I mean, the patches are more complex than this, but I think that's more than enough. So we build it, and yes, grid skip area is already working. Only accepts one area, but it's already working. This is a screenshot I took while I was doing this. So we have the grid skip area, two, two slash two, and it's skipping it, actually. So then we want more than one area, not just one. So first we go to the property definition, and instead of returning just one grid area positions, we are going to return a list, in this case, is a vector, the class that we're using in Chromium for that. But basically, the parsing is still quite simple. I mean, we are going to consume the grid area, and while we, we are finding commas, we try to consume another grid area, and that's mostly all. We are already getting this, I mean, a list of grid areas out of this. And then, of course, we need to change the converter so it loops the list of areas and, and it converts them, so nothing really strange. And then in the algorithm, the changes are very small. The, the method that was checking if it overlaps with one grid area, it's, it's looping all of them and checking for each of them. It's, this is not very performance, but I mean, it was just an example. And once we implement that, we can already put more than one, and this is already working. Again, here was a screenshot when I was doing this, but if you build that patch, you will get this working like this. We are specifying here four uh, grid areas to be skipped. And then we need to rename it. I mean, this is basically very simple. I did it with a set, and there are just one place more where I need to touch something. And then we have here the, the thing that is actually grid skip areas, and we have these four areas, and we can change this as we want. So for example, we can maybe say, okay, I want from all the corners, that will be something like that. So we are skipping all the corners, or maybe I just want one, and I put something like this, a square in the middle or something. I don't know, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but basically this is working, this is, Chromium with these patches, and it's skipping these areas, basically. So with this, you can do things like this. <laughs> I mean, it's, you can maybe, do, those are just empty, empty divs with some background color, but maybe you can use pictures or whatever. It's not a very simple rule, but you can do things like this, or things like this. I, I mean, you can do whatever you want. And maybe you are putting pictures around that, and it looks very, very nice, I don't know. You, you already can do that or now specifying the positions, but that will be like somehow simpler. 
But I didn't talk anything about testing, and that's really important. I mean, you cannot land something in a browser without tests and without passing all of them and without checking that you don't break the rest of the, of the world with your chains. So basically, in Chromium, they are called layout tests. They are now running to web tests, but everyone still calls them layout tests, I believe. In work, it is the same. So if you run this command, it's going to, uh, this command is going to run all the whole test suite. And it's 86,000 tests. So it's going to take a long time. So you usually don't run, run that locally. You just, I mean, upload the patch and there are bots that will run it and, and, and report the results. You usually, when you are working on some small feature, you run the test for your feature. In this case, for Grid Layout, we have two folders. One for the WPT test, I will talk about later. The other one for internal tests. And in this case, we have almost 1,000 tests. And it says, okay, all run as expected. Not all pass it because we have eight and are not passing right now. That can, those can be the small bars or, that, or they can be like pro features that we don't support yet in Chromium or things like that. And then there is this web platform test repository. I don't know if you know about it, but it's like quite important because, I mean, since a few years ago, all the browsers are using it and sharing the test there, so that's really nice. So this is, again, a GitHub repository. Everyone can send a PR or a new test or whatever. It's shared by all the browser vendors, and it helps a lot improving interoperability between the different implementations. Or when you are working on a feature, you upload the test there, and then if it, they fail in another browser, you can report the bugs easily. It also helps when you are writing specs. If you write the test for that spec, maybe you realize about some corner cases you were not thinking about, or you can find bugs in the spec and all that. In Chromium, there is this folder inside Blink, web test, external WPT, that are where all this, I mean, this is synchronized with the GitHub repository, so it's very simple. If your patch is adding a test there, it's going to go to the WPT repository in GitHub, and in, if there are something new in GitHub, you're going to get it imported automatically, so it's very nice. And about these tests, I mean, they are basically just an HTML file with some JavaScript or some CSS or whatever. For this implementation I was doing, at least we need some parsing tests to check that we are parsing things properly. There are some common utilities here, so it's kind of simple. These are the main things that we are testing. None is none, <laughs> or one is one auto, 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 and we can have a span two, for example, and it works, things like that. And also, we are testing here that we have we can have more than one. Of course, we will need more tests than this, but just like an example of we will need more combinations of things and variations. But and when you run this test in the browser, you are actually getting this kind of pages. So when you are okay, you have six tests and you are passing the six. Of course, if we open this test in a browser without the patches, it's going to fail. <laughs> then you can also write this. I mean, these JavaScript tests, we use this test hardener API that is, I mean, that has a lot of useful methods. In this case, I'm using even another utility, check layout test hardeners. So basically, we have a grid with four columns and three rows. And I'm putting grid skip area one slash one, so I'm skipping the first area and checking that the items, this item goes to the second column, this goes to the third, fourth, the offsetting y is zero, and then the sec the, this item goes to the second column, to the second row already. So the first one is, is not used, and I'm adding here one with two. Basically, it's what we see here. First, the first one is not used, and here these two are not used. And it's checking that, and again, it's only going to pass here. It's similar to the previous one, and there are also these reference tests because all these are JavaScript, so even if you're not painting anything on the screen, maybe you are passing them. <laughs> so that's not very nice. So you also need these reference tests that basically they compare two different HTMLs, they take like a screenshot and compare the screenshots. So basically you tell, okay, this test is going to render exactly the same than this reference file. And in this test we have again, a grid, four by four grid, and we are skipping a square in the middle and then, yes, I have just the grid and all the items that I need. 
And the test passes if you see an empty 100 and 100 pixel box with a 50 pixel green border. So the reference file is just a simple div empty with, with 100 pixels height, 100 pixels border, 50 pixels solid green. And then when we run it, this is the reference file. This will look the same in all the browser. This is just a div with a border. And then this is the Chromium that has these patches built. And it's working fine. And this is Chromium without the patches, so it's not working fine. You are not seeing the gap in the middle. There is this WPTFYE website where you can see actually the results of uh, the different test suites in all the browsers. These are not only for CSS, there are test suites for everything. This is, these are the results for grid layout. So you see that we have a lot of tests and we'll, how they are passing or not in the different browsers. And then at some point, eventually, we need to shift the feature. I mean, we have been implementing it, fixing bugs, and everything is stable, and we want to ship it. So it's, the process is very simple, the technical part. The other part is not that simple. But technically, you just need to change to stable, and you are basically done. I mean, you, that, that will work, but you need to send an intent to ship to the mailing list and again explain why you can ship this, if this is ready or not, and all that kind of stuff. And if that eventually gets into the browser after a few cycles, it will be removed, the, the runtime flag directly, because you're not going to use anymore. But I mean, all this needs to have a review process. I mean, you cannot land a patch in a browser without being reviewed. All the changes need to be approved by an owner or a reviewer, depending on the name they use in the project. And of course, all the tests should pass in all the platforms. So I upload this just to show it here. So it's, I uploaded it, it to Chromium. And here is the whole patch, just one single patch with the whole thing. We see everything is mostly red, the things that build, but the tests are, are failing. So we can go to the details of this, and it's a very large page. But these are the five tests that we are failing. This is when you run the test locally in Chromium or Wacky, you get this kind of UI. OK, you are filing these five tests. And if we check them, it's because these tests are listing all the CSS properties, so we are adding a new one. So we will need to modify the expectations of that test. So I mean, to include the new, the new, the, the new properties, quite simple. And these ones, the web exposed ones, they are more tricky because if you want to modify this, you need like the approval, the intent to ship and the approval from API owners in the case of Chromium. So it's not, I mean, it's just, it's already, these are the things that are shipped, the properties that are exposed to the, to the web without any runtime flag or anything. Okay. So, yes, I mean, nowadays with all the, browsers using, or most of the browsers using open source web engines. It's contributing to the web platform is a totally open process. And at some point, eventually everyone could, could do that. But uh, I mean, shipping a feature is not something for free. You cannot just ship something and remove it a few cycles later because people are start to use it. And that's, I mean, when something is shipped, it's very hard to remove it. And you have all these interoperability and backwards compatibility issues and things like that. So you need to be really sure when you are taking that step and it's not that simple to achieve that, that point. Even for small features and that, is, it takes a while. And then, the, I mean, the open world platform is more open than ever somehow, thanks to the open source projects. So external, like individuals or companies, other than browser vendors can contribute you can report bugs, you can start bugs, vote bugs in the different bugzillas. So browsers know that people are willing to implement those things. You can use the new feature while they are behind runtime flags and provide feedback about them, what you are missing, what things that you would like or what bugs you find in them. You can write, tweet, speak about these things in places, explaining what use cases you are missing, participate in the CSS working group discussions and GitHub issues, and you can even implement the feature yourself. You see that it's not that complex. I mean, or sponsoring someone like Igalia to do that kind of work. I mean, we are a company that can do that, but there are more, and some big companies have some 
internal teams working in browsers and things like that, so it's not impossible. Of course, like in any open source project, you cannot just appear or drop a big feature. I mean, expect that it's going to be accepted and go away. I mean, you need some collaboration with the community, participate there for a while, get well known there, get some kind of reputation and get trust about your work. So that takes a while, but, but it's possible. And then, yeah, I have to say thanks to Bloomberg because without their support, I won't be working on Grid Layout and Igalia won't be working on all this. And probably Grid Layout won't be in the stage that is right now without, without their support. So it's really nice. And that's all from my side. Thank you, everyone. If you have any question, comment, I will be here the whole day. Okay. Oh, very interesting talk. <laughs> it's always interesting to have such different views into what we're talking about here. So that's very cool, man. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So we'll start with the controversial one. Um, Chromium over the past several years has been getting more and more market share of the web. And with Edge consolidating into being a Chromium-based browser, that's not showing any signs of stopping. What are your thoughts on how this might affect your work at Agalia or just the web as a whole? Yeah, I mean, for the web as a whole, I think it's a pity to lose something like that. I mean, having more browser engines competing for the market is always good. Competition is good to do innovation and all that. I don't know how things are going to evolve. It's true that Chrome has a very huge market, but at the same time, WebKit still has its market on the mobile sector, especially. And Firefox has also its own market, so it's, I don't know. I mean, I don't have a clear answer to that. Let's see how things evolve. I think it's better for the world to have as more, I mean, good projects and that healthy projects are evolving the web as possible, but let's see how, how things go. The good things is that at least everything is open source now, so mm -hmm. that's a positive aspect. I mean, everyone can contribute and everyone can take advantage of that code. Yeah, and ultimately forking is possible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what makes your work exciting? So I, <laughs> I really, I mean, I, I really like to work on implementing this kind of features. I mean, even small things or whatever. I think it's really nice that I can, yeah, I mean, implement something that is used for a lot of people. That's like in, an amusing feeling somehow. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to implement this small thing, or maybe for me it's not that important, but at the end, a lot of people love it and say, okay, this is really great. This is what, what we need. <laughs> on that note, uh, what, new feature to grid uh, that you're either working on now or would like to work on? What feature would you most like to work on to add to grid? What do you think would be coolest to do? I mean... The, like, doesn't have to be something that we've already written up. Do you have any ideas? New ideas? Uh, yeah. That's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, subgrid is already the, the cool thing now these days. That's true. Subgrid is very, very cool. But, I mean, I've got new ideas. This, this is not bad, but it's not really... I mean, it's not that important, not a big UK, but it's a good one, I think. I don't know. There can be more. <laughs> okay. Um, so my phone keeps going to sleep. <laughs> so grid layout's a pretty complicated sort of algorithm. And I know that we've done a lot of work to try to keep it as performant as possible. Um, what things have, what's like the most interesting inflection points for trying to make sure on your side that grid stays performant and nice and fast uh, to go with? Like, what, what has been problems to work around that were initially slow, but you're able to fix them up? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think Grid is somehow new still, and it still has some performance issues that can be improved. I mean, it's still not very widely used. I mean, it's, it has been in the ship for a few years, but it's still it's getting adoption. So I think we will find more complex use cases that will have more requirements regarding performance. So I think there are room for some optimizations. At least, I don't know a lot about Mozilla implementation, but the other two have room for some optimizations in some cases. And yeah, the transaction algorithm is like the key part. It's quite complex. All this second path that we need to do sometimes mm -hmm. creates complexity and perform. I mean, it's not good for performance, but yeah, let's see how things evolve. Yeah. Um, you and your company work in a couple of different standards bodies, CSS, 
TC39, I think you do some work in, uh, for what wig specs. Um, how does the process, if any, uh, of how you interact with the standards bodies differ between the different uh, ones? Yeah, I mean, we participate in the different, I mean, like in the communities in the projects and also, also in the standards parts. We participate in W3C in the different parts, CSS working group in accessibility a lot, and other parts, and yeah, TC39, for example, for JavaScript. I mean, that is similar to what happens in an open source project or whatever. You need to start slowly and get to know people, get to participate, contribute something small here, something small there, and then you get more relevance in those fields, and then at some point you eventually end up editing a spec and being or a, like a really important contributor for this or whatever. But it's like, I mean, like the same process that happens in an open source project in general, I believe. Okay, so the, the working group you're working in under doesn't seem to have a huge effect on you. They're all kind of similar from your perspective, at least. Yeah, I mean, I don't know other working groups as well as the CSS working group. So, I mean, but I think more or, the, more, more or less all of them work in a similar way. Okay. Someone had an interesting question about WPT usage outside of browsers. They were wondering if it made sense to contribute to WPT to test polyfills or something, for example. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I didn't test the WPT. I mean, it's quite simple. It's just a PR to the GitHub repository. I think everyone can do it just to test polyfills, to test whatever. I mean, maybe other, I don't know. But, but it's useful also for the, like I said, for the specs. Because when you are thinking the spec, you just write the things. But at the end, when you are writing the actual tests, is when you realize, okay, I, can't be, I don't have a clear answer for this test or what I need to change in the spec. So this is very clear what's expected output, things like that. So yeah, and for polyfills, it can be, I guess, useful. Yeah. And finally, a uh, lifestyle question. What do you do while the browser is compiling? It takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I read mails or I read Twitter or whatever. I mean, it takes a while, but it's, I mean, I have a, a different machine to work on that. Okay. Not, not in the laptop, but yeah, it takes a while. You get used to that at the end because sometimes you need to work on the laptop, but you like somehow try to avoid doing changes in some places that you know it's going to take more time. Some the small changes are quick. And then if you need to do that, you'll think on another task for that. Okay. 10 minutes of your life. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, man. Okay, thank you.